What about uh, what have we found out about the uh, mantas in the Maldives, the particular population that inhabits this country? Uh, it's made up pretty much entirely, as I told you already, about reef mantas, occasional sighting of, uh, of oceanics. The reef mantas that we observe in the country seem to be resident. They don't migrate outside the country, although this is open to discussions. Uh, we have very little data from um, our archipelago like Chagos in the south, uh, or and we don't know if they actually move uh, through the islands down there. Then we know they're able to, uh, even reef mantas are able to uh, long migrations. We have uh, a manta that has been sighted uh, in um, Batol and then all the way south to Addu Atoll. We're talking about 800 kilometers migration. So they're able to cross wide channels and it's not impossible that they can reach uh, other archipelago in the south of the Maldives or even in the north and maybe reach uh, Sri Lanka and India. But this, so far we have no data of that. So we assume it's a closed population that doesn't really leave the country. Uh, as I told you, so far we've recorded 3,300 different individuals. We have a high reciting rate for most of the atolls, and we estimate that the population in the Maldives uh, exceed the five, 6,000 individuals, but probably not much more than this. And also there's a very, um, it seems to be very differentiated, the, um, the south from the north. Obviously the monsoon is much more intense in the north and central northern atolls than in the south and that's why southern atolls doesn't uh, host such a large populations as, as do the northern atolls like North Male, Ba and Ari Atoll. What is so special about the Maldives? Why the Maldives host the largest population of mantas in the world? This will bring me then to Hani Faru. Uh, it's the, the particular position. The Maldives is, um, is a ridge, it's basically an underwater extincted volcanic ridge that stretches north-south right in the middle of an Indian Ocean, a very deep ocean that on average is three to four kilometers deep. And uh, this archipelago, this country, the Maldives, basically acts, acts as a barrier to the monsoonal currents and winds and creates uh, uh, upwelling currents, basically. Uh, you know about, obviously, the main two seasons in the Maldives, the, Hilango, the Hulango and the Hiruvai. Uh, we are now starting the Hulango, which is the southwest monsoon, where winds and currents, very strong currents, uh, continuously hit the Maldives from the southwest. And these deep currents, uh, as they hit the Maldivian archipelago, deflect north and basically bring all the nutrients from depth to the, to the surface, to the atolls of the Maldives. These nutrients then obviously kick in uh, 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 sort of um, um, a planktonic bloom, uh, so basically uh, plankton starts feeding on, uh, on the nutrients that are brought at the surface and as the current passes through the Maldives, the waters become even more and more rich in plankton until on the leanward of, the, of, the, of each atolls on the, on the other side, there's a high concentration of uh, plankton, especially zooplanktonic food, and this is what mantas feed on, and this is what makes this country so special and uh, so able also to, to host such a large population of mantas. Hani Faru Bay is very special uh, because of its position, because of its structure. Uh, you maybe saw some pictures of it, but otherwise, there you go. This is Hani Faru Bay, and it's, um, uh, and it's a site located on the east, northeast um, coast of uh, Ba Atoll. Um, I explained you right now about the southwest monsoon. Uh, in a second, I will show you a video about uh, what happens exactly in Hani Faru. But basically, Hani Faru Bay is that uh, this is the Faru. The actual bay is this area, which is only about the size of a football pitch. It's a very small area. But because of its position, Hani Faru is placed right next to the, to the oceanic channel and it faces the west. Uh, so during the southwest monsoon, what happens is that lunar currents, as you can see in this, uh, in this image, lunar currents as the tide rises, bring in all the nutrients from the depth of the atoll inside the shallow water, but then the monsoonal current takes it up and deflects it into the bay. And this process keep, keep going until there's a massive, on occasion, on particular days around during the year, there can be such a massive concentration of zooplanktonic food that you have a visibility of two, three meters. Uh, and this is only due to the plankton that is there. And obviously mantas as well as whale sharks, so plankton feeders learn that. Uh, they've been living in this country much longer than uh, humans have. And, and every year at a certain time, these massive aggregations happen thanks to the particular structure of this, of this particular lagoon. And this is what happens. These are a few images of mass feeding aggregations that can be seen nowhere else in the world not only mantas, but also, obviously, whale sharks. And as I said, in 2008, on a single day, about four and a half hours of survey, we identified 251 different mantas in Hanifaro. And this is about 
just under 10% of the entire Maldivian population. And actually, Hanifaru Bay, so far we've recorded almost 1,500 individuals. So Hanifaru is visited pretty much by half of the entire Maldivian population recorded so far, which is just a phenomenal number. Um, I'll show you now a short uh, footage, um, just uh, five minutes, explaining more in detail about Hanifaru Bay, um, showing a few amazing footages of the uh, manta feeding aggregations that happened there and also uh, what happens next, what the tourism impact started, uh, started being. Hanafaru Bay is one of countless reef structures in Ba Atoll, and right now it's extremely ordinary. There are a couple of cleaning stations inside the bay that manta rays come to on a regular basis. Here, small reef fish pick parasites off of the mantas in a symbiotic relationship, which keeps the cleaners fed and the mantas healthy. For the Maldives, it's nothing too special. But every year during the southwest monsoon, something spectacular happens here. This ordinary bay becomes a feeding ground of epic proportions. For the feeding to really kick off, everything has to be perfect. During the months of June through November, the southwest monsoonal currents hit the atolls of the Maldives with incredible force, deflecting deep waters full of nutrients up to the surface. As these rich waters cross the atolls, the nutrients are utilized by small photosynthetic algae called phytoplankton, which form huge blooms by the time the monsoon-driven waters have reached the other side. On the eastern side of Ba Atoll, minuscule copepods and other zooplankton feed on the phytoplankton. The lunar current is ultimately responsible for bringing this zooplankton into Hanafaru Bay. We know the lunar current more commonly as the tidal cycle. This strong lunar current pulls deep water filled with copepods west towards the mouth of the bay. The monsoonal current then deflects the tide into the bay where the zooplankton becomes trapped. Once the swarm of zooplankton is funneled into Hanafaru, the feast begins. Mantas that have been patrolling the surrounding waters find the swarm and begin to feed on it as it's carried by the currents. As the zooplankton becomes more and more concentrated, mantas arrive in droves. They open their gaping mouths and unroll their cephalic fins to help channel water into their mouths and across their gill rakers, straining out microscopic food. In order to feed more effectively, the giants perform graceful barrel rolls, diving through the richest patches of copepods again and again. A chain of mantas swoops in like a squadron of giant condors, turning on a dime to make another pass through the thick slurry. And now, the behavior that makes Hanafaru so unique. At high tide, the currents temporarily subside and the zooplankton is trapped inside the bay. The mantas begin to circle, mouths open and cephalic fins extended, taking advantage of the feast.
More and more mantas join the queue, and at the height of feeding, as many as 250 can be present. The swirling mantas reach from the surface all the way to the floor of the bay, 20 meters below, forming a vortex. The vortex feeding actually creates a current of its own, sucking any nearby zooplankton into the center of the vortex and concentrating it, allowing the mantas to feed more efficiently. are found all around the world. You find them in, in tropical oceans. And um, obviously we now know that we're dealing with at least two different species of manta rays. You've got um, the slightly smaller um, reef manta rays, um, which tend to be more associated with smaller range areas, you know, around isolated islands like the Maldives, like Hawaii, Yap, and so on. The reef manta rays here number the thousands. Um, I've already recorded over 2,000 individuals, and I think the population may be as high as you know six, seven, even eight thousand manta rays, and that's really, uh, really pretty significant. And that's why you can come to a place like like Hanifaro here, uh, and you can actually have you know 200 plus manta rays in one go swimming in in just a small area, and that's um, and that's unique. That's there's nowhere else in the world where you get that. I mean, you could fit all of Yaps and, and, uh, and Hawaii's population inside the bay here in one go, and that's, uh, that's something pretty special. While the feeding aggregation at Hanafaru makes it an incredibly unique natural phenomenon, it also makes the mantas here vulnerable to exploitation. These areas are very important. They're very important for the manta rays. Often they're, you know, they're quite concentrated uh, areas. And therefore, if, if a fisherman, for example, was to know where these feeding aggregations sites were, then they could quite easily you know, target those areas and, and very quickly wipe out um, and overfish the population of, uh, of animals that were visiting that site. For these reasons, the Maldivian government has declared Hanafaru a marine protected area banning any kind of fishing or exploitation within its boundaries. The bay now brings in far more money as a tourist attraction than it would as a fishing ground. A number of resorts in Ba Atoll are only a 30-minute boat ride away, bringing divers and snorkelers from all over the world to see this unique event. Commercial fishing pressures on manta rays and their close relatives, mobula rays, are increasing steadily around the world to meet the growing demand for manta gill rakers in the Chinese medicinal trade. As a result, opportunities like this to view mantas in the wild are essential for raising awareness and support for the protection of these animals. But even ecotourism comes at a price. Documentaries and magazine articles highlighting Hanafaru's feeding aggregation have made it one of the most popular dive destinations in the world. Now, hundreds of tourists swarm the bay almost every day during the months of July through November for their chance to see the mantas. As many as 12 boats at a time can be found inside the bay, an area smaller than a football field. On some days, almost 200 tourists are swimming, snorkeling, and diving. If the currents aren't ideal, there may be only 10 to 15 mantas feeding, a ratio of about 20 people per animal that often leads to crowding and harassment. Even during a full-blown feeding event, this many people can be damaging. A ceiling of snorkelers stops mantas halfway through their barrel rolls as they try to avoid colliding with the tourists. Bubbles from scuba divers create a wall in the water column, 
which some mantas actively avoid. The bubbles may also disperse pockets of plankton, making it less concentrated and more difficult for the mantas to feed effectively. Boats trying to maneuver in the small bay to pick up guests put mantas and divers near the surface at risk, and it's only a matter of time before a serious injury occurs. The government has passed regulations to reduce the tourism impact, restricting the maximum number of boats in the bay at any given time to five, and the maximum number of tourists to 80. But here in Ba Atoll, Hundreds of miles from the capital city of Malé, no enforcement of these regulations exists. There are still 10 to 12 boats in the bay on a regular basis, and over a hundred divers and snorkelers. Enforcement will have to come from the local residents of the atoll, from those whose lives are actually affected by how this resource is used. Hopefully the government will put regulation in the hands of the locals, and they have to understand and appreciate what an amazing and unique natural resource it really is if they are to ensure its protection and proper regulation. This is why Guy has invited students from nearby islands in Ba to come to Hanafaru and swim with the mantas. The situation at Hanafaru is promising because right now its most pressing threat is that too many people want to see and appreciate the animals that make this bay so special. With regulation and proper management, the incredible feeding aggregation at Hanafaru can become one of the best environmental advocacy campaigns the world has ever seen. Right, so apologies for uh, the pronunciation of Hana Faru. Apparently Americans cannot really pronounce the V very well. Uh, I always find it funny. Um, so I hope uh, that was interesting. And it tells you, shows you a bit about what happens in Hani Faru and you know, before, uh, before it became uh, a massive touristic attraction. And then the, uh, some footage is showing also what the impact of tourism is. But I will go into more details in a second.